All right. I, I mean, it has to be said. Well, what's this Sunday? Yes, and there are a lot of people that are really excited about this, but I'm excited about this. This is the Sunday where we are preaching on our preaching through our core belief of salvation. salvation. This is it. Love you guys. If Jesus doesn't save, I'm not here. Amen. Jesus saves. We believe it. We've been preaching through our core beliefs. We started with the core belief of Trinity. And then we did the core belief of Jesus' return. And then uh, we did the core belief of humanity. We said humanity is in the, made in the image of who? Image of, God. image of God. And we said that we are sinners by nature and by choice. And last week we hinted at that part of the solution to that is faith in Christ. But this week we're going to hint, we're going to get into what does Jesus do for us. He did something on that cross. And I want to remind you at the end of today's service, we are going to observe the Lord's Supper. We will observe the Lord's Supper. But let's begin with our core belief statement. Let's go to our next slide. We have our core belief statement of salvation. Read this with me. We believe that mankind is unable to satisfy God's penalty for sin. We believe salvation is possible through faith because Jesus' death and resurrection covers the condemnation the believer deserves and grants the believer righteousness they don't deserve. So there's a lot there. This is one of those two-sentence ones. Some of our core belief statements are one sentence, some of them are two. The first sentence is about that word unable. Is God unable or are we unable? We are. We are. So we're going to talk a little bit about that word unable. And then we talk about how salvation is possible through faith and it does, Jesus does two things. One, it covers, Jesus covers our what? Condemnation. Our condemnation. So there's this, there's this negative thing that was coming our way. Jesus takes care of that. But then, oh, I'm excited to talk about this because we, a lot of times in Christian circles, we, we sort of skip this part. It grants the believer what? Righteousness. Righteousness. We're going to talk about this positive thing that Jesus does for us. We could never take care of our sin and we could never be righteous on our own. So let's get into let's get into this discussion of unable. Let's go to this next slide. And we've got Matthew 19. Matthew 19. I've got uh, the main chunk of what we're going to read up on the screen, but let me give you some background to this story. This is a story of the rich young ruler who asks, comes up to Jesus, says, Rabbi, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, Well, let's start out with those commandments. You done them? And does the rich run, rich young ruler say yes or no? Yes, I've done them. I've, I've kept them all. Whether that's true or not, you know, Jesus knows. Um, but then he says, okay, next step, sell everything you have. Sell everything you have. Is the rich young ruler excited about that? No. No, he's supposed to sell everything he have and give it away to the poor. And uh, so that's, that's where our story picks up. We usually read this story as something to equal God doesn't like rich people. And we're going to see that that's, that's, that's shortening the message from what it should be. It's shortening the message from what it should be. But we're going to pick up in verse 24. Or we'll, we'll start in verse 23. My apologies. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. I, again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of of God. Let's pause for a second. We talked about before, I'll, I'll begin with what I've asked you a couple times. Why did they build those pyramids? Did, did they build them because they like tall things? They built it so somebody could have a good afterlife. Who, whose afterlife was it? Pharaoh. Pharaoh. It was for the richest guy in the nation, the guy with all the slaves. If you built a big enough temple, if you owned enough books, if you did the right sacrifices, which all cost money, then you could have a good Afterlife. So in the ancient world, just across all cultures, is the idea that the people with all the money, the wealth, and the power probably had the gods think they were okay. Because obviously they're blessed, so the gods must like them. And the Jewish culture hadn't escaped from this. There was some idea that God must have blessed them, and even more so, they could pay for the rams and the goats and the bulls to be sacrificed. They could pay to have a copy of the Torah in their home or in their village. So obviously God must like them more. But Jesus is saying, is it easy or is it hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God? Hard. He's saying, you think that they should have it easy. It's still hard even for them. And that's 
how this next verse makes sense. Because if it was just, oh, it's hard for rich people, it must be easy for poor people, then the disciples wouldn't say what's next. Listen to what they say. Verse 25, when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be what? Saved. saved. Who can be saved? They're saying, hold on a second. Even the ones blessed by God are going to have a hard time getting into the kingdom of heaven? Jesus says, yes. Who can be saved? The people who can even afford a Bible, who can afford the sacrifices, are going to have a hard time getting into the kingdom of heaven? How can we peasants, who don't look like we're blessed by God, be saved? Jesus doesn't make it any easier. He says, but Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. It's humanity. Does Jesus think that humans have an ounce of a chance? Does he think maybe that a CEO of a Fortune 500 company has a chance of entering the kingdom of heaven on their own? No. The most capable, smartest person, the best business manager, the person who even has enough wealth to build the pyramids, cannot do anything to get closer to the kingdom of heaven than a peasant. With man, it is impossible. You can build the tallest tower. You can build the biggest temple. You can buy Bibles for everyone in the world. It doesn't get you an inch closer to the kingdom of heaven. And this blew the disciples' mind. They lived in a world, and in some ways we still live in a world, where we say those people who are blessed, they must be the ones that God really loves, that God wants to let in. Jesus says, no, with man, it is impossible. And we talked about last week, humanity has a sin problem. We said by nature and by choice, we all sin. Let's go to this next slide to talk about why we are unable. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. What is a wage? If, you're, if your boss said, hey, I'm going to withhold your paycheck till next month, how would you feel about it? Unhappy. Unhappy. I would not be happy. None of you guys would be happy. You'd say, I, I need to use that. And even more so, you would say, it's owed to me. It's owed to me. It's actually illegal to not pay people whenever you say you're going to pay them if you're withholding wages. It's a bad thing. So what, you, what Paul is saying here is the wages, the thing you're owed for your sin, the transaction that should take place from, from God's bank account to yours should be death. That is what you're owed. Even if you're the, even if you're the person who's built the biggest temple, you're owed death. But the gift, who here has received a gift? Yeah, we like gifts. Are you are you owed gifts? Now, your, your three-year-old on their birthday may feel like they're owed gifts. You're, you're at the three-year-old party and they say, this year I only got 27 presents. Last year I, I got 28. This is terrible. But a gift is something you're not owed. What is the gift? Eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The gift is eternal life. I want to point out one thing. Just, just keep this in your mind. Salvation is a gift. What Jesus gives us is a gift. Does it say, and just hold this in your mind, the gift of God is a second chance? What does it say? Eternal life. Hold on to that idea. It doesn't say second chance. Ephesians 2.8. So, what does that say? Ephesians 2.8. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through what? Faith. Faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. Nobody can say, oh, I built a big enough temple. God has to let me in. No. Who's the judge? We talked about Jesus' return. Who's the judge? Jesus. Jesus. It's for him to declare who is righteous. It is for him to forgive not for us to demand. We read the, the scripture passage where Jesus says, there are going to be people that, people that say, oh, we cast out demons, we fed people, we did this, we did that. You have to declare us righteous. And Jesus will say, depart from me, I never knew you. I never knew you. So it is a, it is a gift that we receive through faith. Is faith a big action word? Does faith mean that you're going to build a wall or construct a temple or a tower? No. It's putting your trust in Jesus. So what we what we read about 
was a story of the guy on the cross with Jesus, on the cross next to him. All he says is, he tells the other, he tells the other prisoner, we're sinners. Don't slander this guy. Don't insult this Jesus. And then he turns to Jesus and when his, with one of his dying breaths says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's the first person that Jesus declares as righteous. He says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus, remember me. Well, Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It doesn't say second chance. We're gonna, I want you to see this theme. It says saved. I'm a sinner. Jesus, remember me and your kingdom. So that's the gift. That's a good gift. Can you earn your... I just want to make sure you get this. Can you earn your salvation? No. Is it a paycheck? No. no. Let's go to this next slide. What's that a picture of? Prison. You guys got to say... What is it? Prison. 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 Do you guys think they're on their way in or out? Well, actually, if you look at their hands, their hands are behind their back, but some of the guys' hands are in their pocket. The guys' hands behind their back don't have any cuffs on. Uh, I'm not sure. I want you to pay attention to that. This is a picture from the, uh, who is it? Who is it? Uh, Richmond County, Virginia, uh, corrections. And uh, these guys, I believe, are actually on their way out. And it's the sign says receiving and what? Release. You go into prison in the same spot that you go out of prison. You go in and you give them all your personal belongings. You serve your time. Uh, you, you've paid for your crime, and then you come out and they give you personal belongings. Now, these guys, if they're on their way out of prison, is this a good day? Is release from prison day a good day? Yes. Yeah, they, they, they may be pretty excited. They may be pretty excited. They would say, I have a second chance. But what do most prisoners do with that second chance. What happens? U.S. The National Institute for Justice says that the U.S. has 2.3 million people behind bars in 2013. A lot of people behind bars. But here's the good news. About 95% are going to get out at some point, which is a good thing. The goal is they, they pay for their crimes. They do their years. Hopefully they're reformed. They get out and they're productive in society. Get a job. Straighten up. Don't make bad decisions again. But... Do most, do most people who are in prison go through receiving and release and then never come back? Yeah, it's recidivism. They have recidivism, that's right. Almost three quarters of people who are released from prisons end up coming back. They have a second chance. The, legally, the courts have said, your crimes are paid for, you can start over, but they start over at zero. They start over at zero, or they may actually still be on parole, so they're almost, they're not quite free yet, but they still have to go find a job. They still have to earn respect in society. They still have to break those relationships. They have a second chance. Release from prison day is a good day, but is it always a final day? No. They get released from prison, but it's an important day in a prisoner's life. Let's go to this next slide. What is that a picture of? It's a picture of graduation. What are those people wearing? Cap and gown. What color is it? Yeah, it's, it's well, actually, it's TCU. I, uh, the, the lights mess with It's purple. Purple. Uh, Texas Christian University. Can anybody see Allison? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that was Allison. Uh, she graduated from Texas Christian University. Um, she got her, her doctorate in nursing practice. She's super smart. And then she came to work for St. David's. That's, that's part of the story how we got here. We went to Alaska first. But, uh... That is an exciting day. Who here has been to graduation or graduated from something? It's, it's an exciting day. Do, do, ha, ha, who here at your graduation day had really annoying family come and like blow blow horns and do bells? Anybody ever had that happen? Yeah, <laughs> Teresa had it happen. Yeah, yeah. Those people, man, you, you can't hear all the names, but sometimes you don't want to hear them all. But graduation day is a good day. It's a once in a lifetime day. Now, so in, in release from prison day, there's a good chance they're coming back having to do it all over again. Graduation day, are those usually pretty final? Yeah. I, I hope that out that TCU doesn't say, Allison, actually, you got to come back. You need to do it again. You know, I remember after I graduated from high school, I kept on having dreams that they were like, oh, you didn't take this final. You have to come back. <laughs> it's a once-in-a-lifetime thing. And after graduation, do we start back at zero? 
No, you, for some reason, we've all agreed that once you get that diploma, that piece of paper, that certification, now you have a different level of status, a different level of respect, a different level of knowledge that is recognized by everybody. You've been granted something, whether it's a diploma. Uh, some people use that to get a, get a different career, uh, to change their status. But that's why a lot of people like to graduate. We like to gra We encourage our kids to graduate. So in general, which one do you think families get more excited about? Which one is going to have more people attend? Release from prison day or graduation day? Graduation. graduation day. You have a couple people that really care about you come to release from prison day. But graduation day, all the cousins come out of the woodwork. I want you to keep those two ideas in your mind, release from prison day and graduation day. Let's go to this next slide as we talk about what Jesus does for us. Mark 10. See, in our belief statement, we say that Jesus covers the condemnation we deserve. That's fine and good, but if Jesus never thought that, if he just thought, no, I just want you to all love each other and hugs and puppies, then we're in trouble. He has to, he has to actually agree with that. We can't make Jesus do what we want. He's himself. So Mark 10, 45 is a very short way that Jesus says this. Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man, which is how Jesus refers to himself, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a what? Ransom for many. Jesus believes, thinks, understands that somehow he can give up his life. He can sacrifice his life and take care of other people. You know, we have the idea of like the secret service. Somebody can jump in front of the president and save his life. Jesus thinks that somehow he can give up his life and save a lot of people. A lot of people. At this point, he's still telling his disciples that that's going to be on a cross, but he believes it. Now, did he invent this idea? No, it's, it's actually pretty ancient. In Leviticus 16, we have the story of the Day of Atonement. Jim, are you, are you going to have that Messianic Jew come? Uh, we're still working on it. Jim, Jim's Sunday school class is talking about having a Messianic Jew. He can talk more about this. But in the, uh, in the Israelite Jewish sacrificial system under Moses, uh, you had sacrifices for all sorts of things. You had sacrifices to tell God thanks. You had sacrifices to, to fellowship with God. But they had a big annual sacrifice called the Day of Atonement. And in the Day of Atonement, there, there's rams and there's bulls that get their throats slit and the, the sins of the people are pronounced over them. And there's blood and it's messy. It's messy. But I want you to, to see this verse, uh, Leviticus 16.22. There's another goat. After they've done the sacrifices, after the blood and the burning, the goat shall bear all their iniquities on itself to a remote area, and he shall let the goat go free in the wilderness. The Levitical sacrificial system, God had decreed that the blood of the sacrifice can take care of sins. And you're going to do this sacrifice every year called the Day of Atonement. Atonement means to cover. But in the Day of Atonement, it's everybody knows, everybody's in on it, that even after those blood sacrifices, we have to put our hands on this other goat, speak our sins over them, and cast them out of the camp. Almost as if the whole sacrificial system was saying, we're waiting on someone to get it right the final time. It was waiting on this final sacrifice. This final sacrifice. And Jesus believes that he himself can ransom many with his sacrifice. So Jesus covers our condemnation. We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper at the end of the service. This is just a remembrance. This does not save you. This isn't like the sacrifice of the goat where you did it every year and you really hoped you didn't screw up in the meantime. This is celebrating what Jesus has done forever in a final sense for us. He took care of release from prison day. But let's go to this next slide. He grants us righteousness. You guys know this verse. Say it with me if you know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have a second chance. Eternal life. See, we hear that we are sinners. We talked about last week. Humans have completely screwed up. We were made for dominion. We were made for relationship. We messed those up. 
we sin by nature and by choice. And Jesus says, I'm not coming to wipe your slate clean. There's not a verse in the Bible that says that, that Jesus came to wipe your, wipe your slate clean. He says, I came so you could have eternal life, life that is beyond anything you know or understand. And that's important because a lot of us will say, oh, I walked an aisle, I'm a Christian, I believe Jesus, but our whole life we're thinking, man, I got to make God happy. I got I to gotta watch out. If I screw up again, I'm in trouble. We treat it like release from prison day. We may go back. We may go back. That was under the GOAT system. We're under the Jesus system. He pays for it. He can give you eternal life. I love how 2 Corinthians says it. 2 Corinthians 5. This is written by Paul, which I always I always got to remind you guys, what was Paul's first job? To be a Christian or to kill Christians? Yeah. Kill Christians. So he knows something about being forgiven for sin. Uh, we're going to be, where are we at? Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake, he, meaning God the Father, made him, meaning Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin. So that in him, that is Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. Of God. Here's the deal. If you are in Christ, if you are a disciple of Jesus, if you would say, Jesus is my Savior and Lord, I confess that he is my Lord. And God raised him from the dead. God looks at you and doesn't say, that's one who has a chance. He looks at you and says, that is the righteousness of Jesus, my son. And I have to point out, remember we started with Trinity. Is God the Father ever going to tell Jesus, hey, whoa, don't forgive that one. That's too much sin, Jesus. No, they always work in harmony. So I, I got to really hammer this home. Let's go to this next slide. We have a diagram for you more visual people. Okay, who here is a more visual person? You don't want to read a book, but you'll watch the, you'll watch the movie. Yeah? So here, here's your visual, pers- visual person. A diagram. Your sin goes on who? Jesus. On the cross, he says, Father, forgive them. He's talking about the people in front of them, but he's talking about you. He's talking about you. Your sin goes on Jesus, but after that, it's not going through life and saying, oh, I hope I don't mess up. hope I can keep God happy because Jesus' righteousness goes on who? You. You. Me. You're a child of the King. You are a child of God. You are made right with God. And the eternal perspective on the day of judgment, Jesus will say, this one's righteous. And God will say, yes, yes. It won't be because of what you've done. It'll be because of what Jesus did for you. He didn't reset you back to zero. It's not just release from prison day. It is graduation day. You have a new status. You're a new person in the kingdom of heaven. So let's go to this, this last slide here. New creation. New creation. This is from Paul. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of of reconciliation. Verse 19, that is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting the trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Remember I said that humans are created for relationship and what? The D word? Dominion? God wants us to take part in creation. God wants us to influence creation. Well, we broke it. We sinned. God took care of it. Jesus died. He was buried for three days, but God raised him from the dead. God saved you. He declares you righteous if you put your faith in Jesus. But he's not done there. He gives you the ministry of reconciliation. You are part of the rescue plan now. You're not a nobody in the kingdom of heaven. You are an agent. You are an emissary of the King of Heaven. Just like people invited Linda and brought Linda to church. 
That's your God job now. How glorious that we went from sinners who were owed what? Nothing. We're owed death. Not just nothing. God didn't just nothing us. It was death. God will by no means clear the guilty. We go from there, and because of what Jesus did on the cross and his resurrection, we go to being righteous and to being part of the ministry of reconciliation. It's not released from prison day. It's all the way to graduation day. It's big. And I love this part of it. I got I to gotta stress it. Verse 18 says, and this was all Jesus' idea. Hope it works out. All this is from God. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit are working this together. They're not disagreeing. You don't have to worry about getting to the throne of judgment and Jesus saying, this one's righteous. And God saying, no, they sinned 48 times after they got baptized. Too bad. No, they're doing it together. So I'm going to ask uh, Linda to come up, uh, our time of invitation.